night I was fixing the light in our carports. And I got some stacks of chairs and stood on it. And then as I looked up with my spectacles on, I started to become dizzy. I fell. I fell last night. I hit the concrete. But it's not at my time because I'm preaching today. <laughs> I was lying flat on the floor in order to probably uh, minimize the impact of my fall. I jumped from the stuck stool. And so as I jumped, my knees buckled. From too big low, I fell flat on my back. But it seems like the angel was holding my head. My head did not bounce like that. I fell with my head. Okay. So I'm preaching today and I praise the Lord for the opportunity. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. We are grateful, Heavenly Father God, for every day of our lives is an opportunity to reflect over God your goodness and your grace. For truly, O Lord God, each and every one of us has been saved by your Son through grace and His mercies, but we are all scandals of grace. Scandals because while we were yet sinners, He died. He did not wait for us to be good because there is no goodness in our flesh. And so, Father God, as we come before you and as we open your word, it is only your blessed Holy Spirit who can open your word to each and every one of us. May your words not remain as a challenge, but allow the transforming power of your word not just to cleanse us, but to change us, O Lord God, for your glory. Thank you, Heavenly Father God, for this time and may the precious blood of Jesus cover us so that in the midst of this congregation, Jesus, our Lord, is lifted high. For we pray this, O Lord God, in His most precious name. Amen. The context of this particular book of Peter, called the Petrine Epistles, speaks of living a life, a Christian life, in the midst of problems, in the midst of very strong difficulties. The ruler at the time, Emperor Nero. And Nero has the audacity to burn Christians so that he can eat his food. He will throw Christians in the mouth or he, he, will, he will use Christians as lion's diet. And so from that context, Peter says, persevere. Now allow me to reiterate again as we open the Word of God, to read from verse 7, the opening salvo. Peter said in chapter 4, verse 7, The end of all things is near. When you are living persecuted, every day seems to be the end of the world already. And it is very far from what we are experiencing now. Today we have all the abilities of life. But then, when you are greeted by a soldier and he announced, Caesar is Lord, you don't reply, Amen. Because that is the cult, the emperor's cult during that time. If you are a baptized believer and you have declared the goodness of the Lord in front of the public, being baptized is to announce that you are a follower now of Jesus. You will not say Amen to the greeting of a soldier. But you would rather say, No. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. You better prepare yourself to be onslaughted by, by the lions or be burned at stake or suffer for your faith. Today, we don't even dare utter the word of God to our friends for fear that they may be offended. In a time when we call this the pluralistic society, plural, everything is tolerated. So this is the postmodern time 
when everything is relative and there are no absolutes, can the Christian today stand the onslaught of the so-called specialized or digitalized persecution? He said, the end of all things is near. And so if it's, if it is the end of all things, you would ask, oh, it has not yet come to an end. Thank you. The end of all things is at hand. But you would say, the Bible has been saying that 2,000 years now. Yes, because it has started from that point up to now. And the day of all things tells us that a thousand years is a day unto the Lord. And so our chronological orientation does not coincide with God's orientation in terms of time. In fact, the Lord is not bound by time. And so here you are, you go back now to the fundamentals. Because the phrase, the end of all things is at hand, is also an invitation to a hope. It means that if it is at the portal now of your life, the end, then there is a hope beyond what God is saying and it is an invitation. And so the challenge for us is, if we are living at a time when the end is near, including China near us, starting to build his military and flexing his military powers, and so, it would be difficult for us to really assess how to live our lives. Living in the light of the end times means there are several things Peter is trying to underline here. But allow me to go back to the Old Testament and even into the New so that we could review God's design for all of us. God has designed us to run on Himself. If you are a vehicle, if you are a, a car, you were given the opportunity to run. Your gasoline is God Himself. And He said in Isaiah 43 verse 21, the people I had formed or I formed for myself will be to praise to proclaim my praise. That's our calling in the Old Testament. In Ephesians chapter 10 or chapter 2 verse 10, it says that we were created to what? To do good works. We are His workmanship. The word there is poema or a poem. God has composed us as a poem and it should be read declaring the excellencies of our God. Again, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says that we were created to declare the excellencies of His praise in the Old Testament. You were born again for serving God, both old and the new. And the word servant and minister is synonymous. Would you believe that all of you are deacons? If you are a child of God, you have been called to serve our Lord. And the word there is diaconos. The word serve is diaconos, meaning a minister. And we have used this word in Grace Gospel Church Storm as a slogan. Each one a worshiper. Each one a minister. We have declared it and we are moving towards that not all are learning the way God wanted us in His pace, but we are moving towards that slogan, the fulfillment of that slogan. Mark chapter 8, verse 35 gives us a promise that whoever loses his life for the gospel will save it. And so, with that as our basis for living life in the context of the end times, then Peter suggests two things here. You have to connect 
you have to connect with God and you have to connect with God seriously. Let's take our signal from the Word of God. Verse 7 says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, therefore, so he goes into a conclusion already. Therefore, if the end of all things is at hand, we have to be clear-minded and self-control so that you can pray. Oh, I thought prayer is an easy thing to do. But the Petrin thought says, in order to pray, or for the sake of prayer, according to NIV or ESP, you have to be clear-minded and self-control. And so, when you are praying, you hear many voices inside. And there are things that occupies the mind. That is the reason why we cannot pray. We have to bring into subjection all of the things here and all of the things here so that we can pray. And how do we pray? We should first listen. I, I don't know what to pray. If you are saying that, then you are on the right track. Because in, in chapter 8, verse 26, it says of the book of Romans, he says that we do not know what to pray as we should. And then the Holy Spirit is there to assist us. He helps us so that we can pray. He intercedes for Rachmanuel so that he can pray. He says, he helps us in our weaknesses. And so, the ability to pray comes from the Holy Spirit. And allow me to coin three kinds of prayer in our digitalized time. There are the selfie prayer, there is the godly prayer, and there is the other prayer. These are not literal words. The selfie prayer are not necessarily wrong, but they are focused on what you want and what you need. Again, I say, these are not necessarily wrong. The selfie prayer focuses on the self. Second is a godly prayer. This is worship. The direction is towards God. And you are grateful. And you say, Lord, thank you for the gift of life, for the gift of family, and for the gift of friendship. For the gift you have given me, the community of the faith, the church. We thank you, Lord God. And these are godly, so-called prayer. And then there is the other prayer, wherein the focus is to intercede for the one next to you, the one on your left and the one on your right. Don't ask his prayer request. Ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what does he need? And then listen. Interesting thing. If our minds are not cluttered, we will be able to pray. If we do not know how to pray, then we can use the scriptural. And the scriptural prayer is exactly reiterating what God is saying. Lord, you said that the end of all things is here. Prepare me, O Lord God. Help me. You can use the very verses you are reading as a prayer tool and it will assist us. So we pray. We have to what? To be focused. We have to be clear-minded or sober-minded or self-control so that we can pray. There are three, three vital areas now that the Lord has given us through Here is your second point, which is, as you have connected with the Lord, then you are ready to connect with others. Living a life with the knowledge of the end times is to be able to connect with others as well. Three vital areas of ministry. In verse 8, it says, keep loving one another earnestly. The New International Version says, love one another deeply, sincerely. 
I really like the word, the Tagalog word, manasakit. As I have often referred to it, because to love means you go beyond your comfort zone until it hurts. That's why the root word there is sakit. Manasakit means to go beyond the comfort until it hurts. And you don't like that. If you don't like the concept or the meaning of malasakir, it's a natural thing. But when you begin to embrace the concept, that is not anymore natural. That is supernatural. And that comes, or you are thrust into the realm of the Lord, into the realm of Calvary. So trust yourself. Love one another deeply. Oswald Chambers said it's not there. The thing, the thing that awakens the deepest well of gratitude in a human being is the, is the truth that God has forgiven us or has forgiven sin. I'll quote it again. Oswald Chambers said the thing that awakens the deepest deepest well of gratitude in a human being is that God has forgiven sin. If I am forgiven by the Lord, I can forgive. I can forgive. Love each other. And then he says here in verse 9, what does verse 9 say? Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. You know that word Okay. You know that word, offer hospitality. We get our English word, hospital and hospice. And a hospital is where we receive healing. And a hospice is a place where people are given rest or offered rest. Rest a while. This is your hospice. The words hospice and hospital is now given a new word which is offer hospitality to each other without grumbling. You know, sometimes we help people and then you are noisy inside this head. And the Lord hears your head. You offer things, but you grumble inside. You help people, you feed people, and you call him matakaw, quietly, inside. Ako tao naman. Gumubusto ko. Gumubusto naman itong pagkain ko. Don't grumble. You show hospitality without grumbling. And then, in verse 10, which is our team, each of you has received a gift. I went into the Greek interlinea and I found out that the word gift there is charis. As each has received grace or a gift, then use it to serve one another. Again, the word there to serve means to be a deacon. So to be a deacon is not confined to the people you will Amen. When? After after mission conference. No, no. All of you are deacons in your own right. Because God has designed you to be deacons, to be ministers. So use whatever you have to minister to one another. And so each one of you should grow as a worshiper and each one should grow as a minister, as a deacon. And as God has equipped you for your particular assignment, I got this from Rick Warren's book. Rick Warren says, so that you will enjoy the assignment God has given you, he said, and he gave, he made an acronym, which is SHAPE. He said that, start discovering your spiritual gifts. 
And then, listen to your passion. Listen to your heart. I am called to minister to the poor. And that's why for the past 13 and a half years, as I have started in the ministry, that is where I was working in the Mormon Court Ministry of Kalas, Balikbalik, and Sampalo. And then, and I was then one of your missionaries. After 30 years of service, and I am now 60 years old, I cannot drive, I cannot drive anymore my bitek, my bitek leta. And I don't know if I fall, I would be able to rise immediately. There are several times I fell from the bicycle. I brought my children to school on the bicycle and for many, many years, for more than seven years, we only had a few accidents with my son in front, in front of the bicycle. I, I cannot do that anymore. I am getting old and my time is uh, moving towards eternity. One life, 100 years or less, one life. And so we continue to deliberate and says, Lord, what is my passion? Because if you observe things in the ministry and then it resonates inside, you better listen to your heart because if there is a resonance from what you are observing and what you are experiencing inside, God, the Holy Spirit, is speaking to you. That's it. What are you waiting for? The reason why I have exposed you into these things is for you to be catalyzed so that you will be able to resonate with what I am doing in that part. Remember, when you are assigned, God is there ahead of us. God is there ahead of us. And so you ask the Lord, Lord, where are you for me? Where are you as you want to use my life? So these are your passions. And then what are your abilities? Apply it. What is your personality? Are you a people person, a concept person, or a task person? Well, God has something for you, a wonderful thing for you using your personality. And lastly, you have experiences because God has been tempering you through time and is preparing you and has been giving you experience after experience so that He may maximize your life. And most especially, don't close your hearts to the pains you have gone through. Because someone said, and I told, or that is C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis says, the Christian is most effective when broken. I will repeat. The Christian or the believer is most effective when broken. There is no time for transcending. So it's only the Lord who uses these broken pieces and exposes the magnificence of His power and His love for others. Experience. Think about it. Remember Rick Warren's so-called shape spiritual gifts, what's H? Your heart or your passion. And then A is ability, personality, and then experiences. And it says, as we go back to the scripture, if you have a speaking gift, then speak as if you are speaking the oracles of God. And what are oracles? The oracles of God are the burden of God. And He communicates His burden to his children. You know, I have a burden for these things. Those are the oracles of God. And if you have the speaking gifts, then speak as if you're speaking the burdens of God. And you can only know the burden of God if the word of God is speaking in your hearts. But if I ask you today how many or how much of God's word is in us and living in us, and your answer is, I have memorized John 3.16. I have not even memorized the verse 17. <laughs> you, you <remember. laughs> we will never 
completely hear the word of God, but we will try to move in a very generic and generalized way. You want to say that? Yes, generically. But God wants you to understand that there is specificity in the use of your talents and gifts. Speak the oracles of God. Speak the burden of God. Jeremiah 29 verse 13. This was given to me this morning only. 3.30 a.m. I could not speak anyone getting old. And as I open the word of God, I am about to read this passage again after many times of reading it. And all of a sudden, a verse was given to me. And Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says, You will seek me and find me. And you seek me with all of your heart. But if when your eyes open and you move to that sacred place and open your sacred passage called Facebook, you will miss the word of God. Because the starting point, your starting point, is the gospel according to Twitter, according to Facebook. You will not hear the word of God that way. Jeremiah 29, 13 from the Lord says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Then you will begin to understand what burdens God. Then you will begin to understand and see things through his eyes and feel things through his fingers and through his heart and then you become an extension of the world an extension of the world allow me to give what motivates Paul Paul says he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. That is his starting point. As he announces his stepping out of the Ephesian church in chapter 20 of the book of Acts 24, he announced, however, I consider myself worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That is his motivation. The word of God drives him and it drives him well. But we have to take out our spiritual tutole, remove it so that we can listen. Again, you go back to the start. In order to pray, be clear-minded and self-controlled. You need to ask the Spirit of the Lord to control your thoughts so that you will be able to sort the voice of the world, the voice of YouTube, the voice of uh, Facebook and others, from the voice, the small voice of the Holy Spirit. The last, the last letter written by Paul before they jack off his head was second Timothy. And there he bears out his heart and says, Done. I have fight the good fight. I have finished the race. In front of me is my reward. I have served my master. I am ready to go. Question. This is the third and last point. If we have been challenged from the Word of God, why can we not serve with all of our heart? Well, someone said, if you are not serving the Lord, if you are just existing, if you are not involved in the ministry, you are missing a lot in God's kingdom. And so, Please allow me, without you getting angry at me, I'm only a messenger. What excuses have you been using? In the next slide, allow me to enumerate to you the possible excuses we are using. And these are the things 
we are using. I am, now, as we slowly read this, please read it with me, quietly. Ask the Holy Spirit, am I using this or what? Excuses we use. I am both matanda na ako. I feel insecure. I am unattractive. I have been abused. Lord, I don't know how to speak. I stutter. Lord, I am poor. I cannot give. I am codependent. What is codependence? I give so that He will become dependent on me and I feel significant. That is codependence. Immoral. Had an affair with with others and many family problems. Lord, I cannot serve because I have this. I'm this. And then you are suicidal. Depressed. You feel reluctant. Or, I cannot serve. Lord, I am a widow already. You feel you are eccentric. You are off tangent many times. You are impulsive or hot-tempered. You worry a lot had several failed marriages, unpopular, has doubts, poor health, timid. Question. Have you felt these things? If your answer is yes, check one of those. Or you put it there in your in your note. But keep it to yourself. Because before you utter it before the Lord, the Lord already knows that. And so, these are the excuses we use. But let me announce to you the misfits in the Bible. The misfits are the unlikelies in the standard of men. You say you're old. Abraham was old. He was called of God past the hiring age. What's the hiring age? We get hired up to age 30. Uh, those who are in the age five. What's the final hiring age? Are you here? <laughs> Jacob was insecure. Leah was the unloved wife. He tried to attract Jacob, but she could not until the Lord remembered her and gave her a son and he called her him, Judah, where Jesus came. And so this is the unloved wife. And many, many years later, Jesus will come from one of his sons. Joseph was abused, we know his story. Moses said, I can't speak. He was given Aaron. Gideon was poor. He was so poor, he wanted to save what he has worked for and he was hiding. Samson was codependent. Rahab was immoral. David had an affair and all kinds of family problems. Elijah says, I Lord, just just kill me. He was suicidal. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, was depressed. Jonah was the reluctant prophet. He wouldn't want to serve the Lord in that area. He wants to be assigned in a place he wanted to, but not Nineveh. Naomi was a widow. He went out of Bethlehem full and he came back empty and a widow. John the Baptist was eccentric. He has the most, well, let's just say, uh, different uh, white robe, camel's hair, bell, and he is locus. Eccentric to say the least. Peter was impulsive and hot tempered. Martha worries a lot, and the word worry means to be divided into a hundred and one direction. The Samaritan woman had several failed marriages. Where is your husband? I don't have a husband. You are right, the Lord said. The one that I am nakikilig in is not your husband. Zacchaeus was unpopular. He is from the Isle. Thomas has doubts. One of the twelve discipled for three years and still have doubts. Paul had poor health. And Timothy, when he was timid, and it gave Paul an opportunity to write another letter compared to Titus. 
these are quite a variety of misfits, but God used each of them in His service. Now, if you try to tell me I have been using two or three excuses, here are your answers. God used these people. And they have definitely serious excuses. I don't want to say this. You read it. And this is what we should read. Acts chapter 3 verse 19, Sister Benton. You ask the Lord, I'm sorry Lord for making excuses. And then turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And you will know what it is to serve the Lord without grandstanding even if nobody sees you. You know the Lord sees you. And so how do we glorify the Lord? Living in a time where the end times is at hand. We say we need to honor the Lord by connecting with Him. And that is how you will glorify our Master. He's coming back. He is coming back. And all of us will give an account of our time, talents, and treasure. What have you been doing to honor Him? We honor Him for who He is, for what He said, the Word of God, for what He did for us on the cross, what He continues to do for and through us today, and what He will do tomorrow. And so, allow me to summarize these five points here and say, may I humbly propose that motto, know Christ and make Him known. Know Christ. To know Him is far better than knowing your sweetheart. To knowing how much you made this year. To know Christ and then to make Him known. Our lives here on this planet, our 100 years here in this planet, will be evaluated on this phrase. Did you know Him? Or you know Him only in the head? It did not affect your heart and it did not move your hands and your feet. To know Him and to make Him known. You do that, we will be evaluated in these areas of ministry as we leave the end times. On the area of prayer, on the area of loving, on the area of hospitality, and on the area of serving. Use your gifts. And he said, faithfully administer God's grace. He said, if you have a speaking gift, speak as if these are the oracles of God. If you have a serving gift, then serve as a deacon with the strength God provided. And the objective is to honor or give glory to the Lord. Let me close. I have a friend. He walked in. I really don't know him, but he walked in Grace Gospel Church North. And the first song he heard was the song of grace whether that is Amazing Grace or the song of Chris Tomlin being sung inside. And the lyrics of the song gripped his heart. I never realized that he is a composer and a musician and a worship minister in a particular church. He has resigned. This guy is a worship minister and a pianist. As I come to know him better, I heard from the wife that he used to accompany Agnita Seguil Reina. So he was accompanying Agnita. I wouldn't know that until the wife 
and said, He is a pianist. He composes songs. And he is in charge of the worship of Sundays in their church. But he's not doing that anymore. He is not only a pastor, he is an educator. Why? Because he is connected to the text. So he is a bi-vocational. He supports himself as a worship minister. He prepares everything done on Sunday. And then he composes songs. He arranges the music in their church. And that's, it's not doing that anymore. But he's still working in decks. He is part of the think tank of decks without mentioning his name. 2013, he got sick. And for the first time, he was immobilized and started to shake. Rushed to the hospital, the doctor said, this is not a stroke. So they continued to diagnose him. After a year, thinking that he had had a heart attack and a stroke, only to be corrected by another doctor and said, Sir, let us check your neurological uh, capabilities and function. Then he realized that he has been afflicted with Parkinson's disease. And so, because of that, he cannot work as a pastor anymore. And that day was a turning point in his life. He composed 40 songs, original songs. He sang in our church a song entitled Surrender. And then he composed another song and sang it in the church again. The title is Grace. Because he would like to give this as a token to the Lord for the grace accorded him as he is not part of the church in North. What have you been doing lately? Nothing, he said. And I told him, you cannot minister anymore in the way you wanted, but you can minister out of your vulnerability. And so he announced that this is my situation, he said, in the church. And he has been singing from time to time as I invite him to sing. And out of that brokenness, his brokenness is now used as a ministerial tool. Do not be afraid of exposing yourself, especially your weaknesses. You know, when pastors share their exploits, people forget. But when they share their weak point, everybody remembers. Everybody remembers when we share our vulnerability. And so he allows God to use him he does not sing well because he stammers and then he walks in slow-mo because he has an on and off from moment to moment. He would freeze and he could not move and everybody waits. Parkinson's disease is a very debilitating disease and yet even if he has this and he said every year it is getting grave. And so, then let us serve the Lord. Sabi ko kay Edgar. His first name is Edgar. Then Edgar, let us serve the Lord up to the last breath. And be quiet to fight. You don't have Parkinson's disease. You have other diseases. Excuses. You go back to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. You know what? Uh, Alex also told me, to remind you of this. You have it in your in your Google. Use your talent wisely. These are the services opportunity. And it enumerates there. Put your name, your cell phone number, how to get in touch with them, your email. And then if what you have goes beyond this, then put it in the others. And this will be probably collected as you go out. Let us have this time of silent prayer and ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what resonates in my heart from the things listed here? From the things listed here. As you are going through it, be an usher, 
help in DDPS, coordinate and prepare meals, I can do that. Okay? Let me tell you, when I was assigned in, in San Paolo, I was praying for my team who will join me in San Paolo. And I was listening to the people in front. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit says, you're looking for people, they're not there in front, they're downstairs. So following that impulse, I went downstairs and he led me to the kitchen. There are your workers. People who fight to serve. And so I realized the one who cooks the meal and the one who mounts the pulpit to stand and exhorts you will receive the same reward. And I said, well, thank you. I am honored to be part of this unlike this. One standard, people standard. Ask the Lord, which of these? Which of these? Now let me end. I should be liberated from these things and say, Of oh, Lord, I don't have my gifts listed here. Then put it in others and then we'll sort it out and we can all pray. Let me close. Leonard Robin Hill, an old preacher, an old traditional preacher said, the question is not whether you are challenged. I will repeat. He said, the question is not whether you are challenged. The question is where you changed. You have been challenged for more than 30 years, 40 years. The church is how many years already? 60? 65 years? To those who have been healing day in and day out, 53 sermons in a year, for how many years? You have constantly been challenged. That's not the bottom line. But when you change, that is the bottom line. That is when you meet the Lord. Not just in the level of, or in the realm of challenge, but in the realm of transformation. Let us pray. And every father, we are grateful that as we are reminded today, we can live over time in the end times. It has started 2,000 years ago and it is coming to an end over this span of your dispensation, O Lord God. We thank you, Heavenly Father, God, that grace and mercies are available. Your word, O Lord God, in Psalm 23 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Heavenly Father, as the senior leaders, O Lord God, are getting older by the day and by the minute, we thank you, Lord God, that this is your church and you are preparing people. You are preparing people, O Lord God, to handle wonderful responsibilities, O Lord God. Not just in this church, but in your kingdom, O Lord God. And so, Father God, with the one who died for us, with the one who lived again, be the starting point, O Lord God, of our service. Each of us, O Lord God, may we be enamored, or may we fall in love again and again with your Son, so that if the thought of our God will, will propel us over God to humble service in our kingdom and in this church. To you, Heavenly Father, be all the glory and the honor and bless the Holy Spirit. I leave the rest to you to speak to them continually after I am gone to the pulpit. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' most precious name, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord.